Welcome to the Feisty Women's Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gross, Ironman champion, PhD in women's history, and founder and CEO of Feisty Media. I started this show because I wanted to cut through the BS of diet culture and fitness culture and actually learn from high achieving women at the top of their game who have figured out how to feel and perform their best at every stage of life. So I chat with experts, elite athletes and leaders who have learned to succeed despite the massive gender data gap in exercise and medical science and product development. Every episode is filled with information, advice, and anecdotes that will help you fulfill your potential as an athlete, mom, leader, or business owner. And listen up. If you don't subscribe to our women's performance newsletter, you are definitely missing out. It's totally free. So head over to womensperformance.com and subscribe now. That's womensperformance.com. This podcast is a production of Feisty Media. Okay, feisty friends. Today we have part two in our active pregnancy double hitter. I hope you all enjoyed last week's sort of deep dive into the science of exercise and pregnancy with Dr. Christy Adamo. If you haven't listened to that one yet, definitely go back and check out that episode after you finish listening to this episode, of course. So today's episode came together in a kind of a funny way. About a month ago, I was at the Endurance Exchange Conference in Austin, Texas, and I hosted a panel about the future of the fitness industry, which if you would like to hear that panel is actually on currently on our podcast feed or other feisty podcast feed called the business of fitness and that is hosted by molly herford um, so you can hear that our discussion of the future of the fitness industry over there if you would like um, but anyway after the panel a coach called harry came up to me and told me about today's guest moria who struggled to find good information about exercising during her pregnancy super relatable so she took matters into her own hands and decided to document her entire experience um, of training during her pregnancy and all the resources that she used once i saw the document i thought oh this is pretty cool um and decided to ask moria to come on the show and coincidentally feisty media we've also interviewed um, Moria many years ago because she was the founder of one of the first and she was the founding coach I guess of one of the first NCAA women's triathlon teams and we are excited to have her back today so Moria Caveras she is current she currently serves as the national director for Laureus USA which is a grant making nonprofit organization that supports the growth and deepens the impact of programs that use sport as a tool for change. She's also a lifelong athlete. She was first a swimmer on Boston College's Division I swim team and is now an all-American amateur triathlete. Moria and I talk through everything she learned during her active pregnancy and swap notes on our experiences. I think we're heading into an era in which women can feel confident about being active while pregnant, knowing that outside of mitigating circumstances, uh, it's, it is better for us and for our babies. So before we hear from Moria, I have one feisty announcement this week. Feisty Media is hosting a live panel on the eve of International Women's Day. So that is March 7th at 4 p.m. Pacific. Um, and the panel is to discuss why equality is no longer enough in sport, meaning that in order for women to have full access to sport, we need to create equity, not just equality. So looking at things like maternity leave for pro athletes, more sports science being done, looking at women's physiology. And we're bringing together a panel from a variety of corners of the sports world. So we have Muslim American triathlete Khadija Diggs and Paralympian Jessica Tuamela. Um, and we also have former pro cyclist Ali Tetrick on the panel. 
And I get to host the event with the one and only Celine Yeager, host of the Hit Play Not Pause podcast. So you can join the live stream as well and ask your questions there, or you can listen to that panel right here on this podcast feed on International Women's Day the next day, March 8th. We will be publishing it. To join the live feed and ask questions with us while we are live streaming and to see us because that's so exciting, um, <laughs> you, we, you have to sign up. So we will uh, drop that link in the show notes for you. Hope to see you there. Hi, Moria. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Yeah, I'm so excited. I met a friend of yours at Endurance Exchange um, yeah. who said, Harry. Yep, yep. Yeah, said to me, like, oh, Harry? Is that- yes, his name is Harry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He said, oh, you know, I know this fantastic woman. She's been kind of tracking everything around her pregnancy and she's been training through it and you might want to talk to her. And then when he said your name, I was like, I think I know her. (laughs) Um, So yeah, thanks for joining us today. Um, What was the impetus? So this document that like Harry referenced, like what was the impetus just to try to write down and track uh, what you were experiencing during your pregnancy as you were continuing to be active? Yeah. So when I first became pregnant, I was kind of like shocked by it. And, and I started to reach out to a lot of different people that had were athletes and had been pregnant and just kind of wanted to know things like what's safe to do, what's not safe to do. And just like learn about their experiences. And I, what I was finding is that people who had had kids like a year, two, three ago, or even longer didn't remember all the details of like what they did week by week or like they were just kind of like guessing at what they did. And I was like, well, I would, I really want to know what people do week by week. I want to know like what happens each trimester. So I'm just going to write down what I do and um, share that with people so that if somebody else is in the same position, when they become pregnant, they can like read an account of, of one person who went through it. Um, and so that's kind of what motivated me from the beginning. Um, and I, I knew I had wanted to do it for a while to like write everything down. And then I had started, this is like another thing about like ne- negative reactions to people like that I've gotten. Um, I had started to post like a little bit on my Instagram, like my fitness chart and all this other thing. And I got a direct message from somebody that's like, that said something like, oh, by posting something negative about your fitness or like your decrease in fitness, you're like, like if your future child ever sees this, like they'll think, you know, that you're really upset about your fitness and like pregnancy is this big negative thing, which was like, not what I was trying to, trying to express at all. And like, I was like, okay, now I really have to write this thing to like show, like, I'm not like, it's not a negative thing. It's just like, my body is changing and I want people to understand how that's changing and like people to understand that this isn't like a judgment call or something that I'm upset about. It's just what's happening. And like, people are curious about what happens to your body when you continue to kind of exercise through pregnancy. So both of those things, both because I had wished I could read an account like that. And, um, because like, as I started kind of like putting out small little bits of information, I realized I needed a longer explanation of of kind of the journey so that it wasn't just like being accidentally viewed as like a negative thing. Cause my run times were getting slower. Or something. Right. You know? <laughs> That's wild. Like, I, didn't, I, like, I didn't think that I would get faster. But, but yeah. 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 When you started that sentence or that story, I thought you were going to say that someone was trying to say that you shouldn't exercise as much during pregnancy. Right. Which is what, like, you know, that's, I feel like I got that message when I was pregnant, but I'm watching now, like, uh, uh, Tia Claire to me, do you follow CrossFit at all? A little bit. Yeah. 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 She's like won the CrossFit game six times, you know, and she's pregnant this year. And so she's been posting things on her Instagram of herself doing, uh, workouts. Right. And if you know, a li- even a little bit about CrossFit and her and obviously how good she is, you know, that like there is a, you can sense the reduction in like the weight that she's lifting and stuff like that. Right. But, oh man, like the internet is just full on jumping on. There's lots of people, to be fair, there's lots of people saying, 
you're amazing. You're such a badass. It's great to see this, etc. And then there's like a whole other faction just being like, you're damaging your baby. Like, here's why. And this kind of, and it's like, oh, it's so disheartening. Um, but it sounds like, you know, I think we're in an interesting place with the whole preg- active pregnancy and how much we know, because like we, we know now that women can do, especially women who are already active or athletes can do a lot more than we assumed before, but there's not a ton of information, right? So when you started looking for information, how much did you find out there? Not a lot immediately. I mean, first of all, just like Google searching is probably like the worst like thing. It's like finding things like, oh, don't like raise your heart rate over 140 or like, um, and then that, that was like debunked or like, don't like exercise so much that you get hot. And like, it just wasn't really helpful. I did around week 20, I had a friend who's like a researcher in Australia who had done like specific research on pregnancy and women. And she sent me like all of her documents basically, which was really helpful. Um, But the, and, but this is like stuff, like only a researcher would like know to look for and have access to. So I did find like, after a little while I did, um, find some good resources. And I was able to like, look up like the British sports medicine journal has like a lot of good stuff too. And they had a podcast and I was able to like, listen to some of that, but at a very cursory level, there's like, just like, unless you're really digging, it's very difficult to find like concrete information on like what to do in beyond just like, listen to your body. Don't like go too hard basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, and you, and we can understand why, right? Because it's like, you don't want to, nobody wants to be the person that tells someone to do something that could actually be harmful. So it's that, that comes from that place of fear, right? So, but that's where it's like really important to actually to know what we can do. It is very important. And, but this is like, another thing is like, I feel like so much of pregnancy is fear-based, right? Like there's like, you know, like you think like you're just like programmed to think like of everything that can go wrong. (laughs) And so like, you are like, Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. And I found like my own progression, like as I went through the first trimester into the second trimester and like, I started reading and learning more. I was like, Oh, I didn't have to be so afraid at the beginning. And I, and it's like hard to say that because like what you're saying is like, nobody's going to tell like a pregnant woman to like overdo it. But I think the more that I learned, the more that I was like, oh, this is actually fine. And this is safe um, to like, to like push it a little bit. So I I give like one example is like, I raced at week eight and I was like, so nervous about going too hard. And so like, if you look at my heart rate data, like my heart rate comes nowhere near my max. It's a, and it was a super sprint triathlon. And then in week 23, I raced another time, like a running race. And my heart rate like got really high because I was like, I felt like I knew a little bit more at that point. Um, And I was like less afraid of, I was like more in tune with uh, my effort than like being afraid, if that makes sense. Um, So yeah, anyway, there is this like fear um, and, and maybe rightly so, but it's like kind of hard because it's like, how much can you, do you lean into the fear and how much do you lean into like, pregnancy isn't a disability, like women can do a lot of things. And it's like kind of hard to, to figure out what that balance is, you know? Yeah, totally. And you raced at 23 weeks and a super sprint. Yeah, I mean, so I guess it's not really a race, but like I participated in a running race. Did people look at you or cheer you or did you have, was there a reaction from, from the crowd? <laughs> yeah, I actually was like, my stomach stayed kind of small. So it's like, I live in New York city and I'm like at 35 weeks now. And it's like, I still am sometimes not getting people to stand up for me on the subway, which is very fresh. I mean, I have a big coat on because it's cold out, but, um, I don't know how many people realized I was pregnant while I was running that race. Like I could have just looked like I had a little bit of a gut. Um, so I didn't get many comments, but I did run by like a very big, big, it's a Thanksgiving day race. And so my family was watching and like, they were very encouraging, but I didn't get a lot of comments in that race, so. Right. And how did you decide to proceed with your training? Like I I read in your document that you were doing sort of 12 to 14 hours of training prior to that kind of as a mm-hmm. amateur um, triathlete. Am I right about that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then how did you decide what to do when once you knew that you were pregnant? 
so I have a coach and I've been coached through the entire thing. So he writes all my workouts, but like, he's not here with me all the time. Like he lives, I live in New York, he lives in Florida. And so for the first, like until about week 18 or 19, I really just tried to follow the, what he was giving me because I was like, oh, it's in my workout plan. I should just do it. But that was not a, like always the right decision. <laughs> like sometimes I was just really tired and I was like, I really just needed to take the day off. And so he and I had like a pretty big heart to heart because he doesn't know. And he, he is, I mean, none, none of this is his fault because he would say to me all the time, like, if you're tired, if you're like feeling exhausted, just take the day off. And I would like, it's a little bit of the athlete mindset. You just kind of like try to push through, mm-hmm. um, or like do what's on your workout plan. But like by 18 week, 18 or 19, I was like, I cannot keep up with some of this stuff. I need to like take it easier. And, and he was like, yeah, you do. Like, you just need to like make this, I'm not there with you. I can't make these decisions for you. So at that point I was kind of like, then I started making a lot more decisions on my own about like which workouts I was going to do, which ones I was going to scale back. Um, and that kind of thing. So that's kind of how I approached it. He had trained a lot of pregnant athletes before. So I kind of had my trust in him to, to make good decisions, but then I think it was just like a matter of me also trusting myself to make good decisions for myself. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it was kind of interesting because I wanted this very regimented, like here is the, the protocol that you must follow when you're pregnant kind of thing and trusted him to do that. But like what I discovered over time is that everybody is so different and like how you feel on a day-to-day basis is going to vary greatly. And like the symptoms that come up are going to be different and whether or not I have a hard week of work is going to make a much bigger impact than when I wasn't pregnant. Like, do I have to travel for work? All of these things. So um, it took me a little bit of time to realize I, I really needed to be, be very conscious of listening to my energy levels in my body, I think. Endurance sports should be accessible to everyone, right? That's why we are so excited to be partnering with Motive. Motive is one of the fastest growing training apps in the world today with thousands of amateur athletes signing up every month and a nearly perfect 4.9 star rating in the app store. You are not a template and your training plan should not be either. Prepare for running races, triathlons, cycling events, duathlons, or swim runs, however your season schedule shapes up, and get training written by some of the best coaches in the world in each discipline who know what it takes to help amateur athletes reach their goal on race day. The app takes the training written by those experts and then creates the most optimal training plan for your schedule, abilities, and goals. Plus, the training is fully customized to your race schedule. How much you can train each week, your current abilities, and the goals you want to achieve in your race. You can use the app for free as long as you want or get all the upgraded features from the app for just $19.99 a month. But as a feisty listener, you can sign up at mymotive.com and use the code FEISTY for two months of full premium access. That's right, you get two months of premium for free. So you quite literally have nothing to lose. So head over to mymotive.com, M-Y-M-O-T-T-I-V.com and use the code FEISTY, F-E-I-S-T-Y. And on a personal note, I know the founder of Motive and he is driven to make triathlon and all endurance sports more accessible for the athletes who care about their performance, but who aren't quite ready for a full-time personal coach. If that sounds like you, definitely try the app for two months for free. You literally have nothing to lose. As we head into summer, rest and recovery are critical for improving sports performance, reducing stress, and living a long and healthy life. We should all invest in better sleep. So think about the thing you lay your head on for eight hours a night. If it's not exactly right for you, it can lead to needless tossing and turning, or worse, have you waking up with an unrelenting kink in your neck. 
My new Lagoon pillow has helped me improve my sleep immensely by pairing me with the performance pillow that has everything I need. So I personally was matched with the Otter pillow. Shout out to Team Otter, which I love because it has a gentle cooling effect. And I was able to choose how much stuffing I wanted in it, which is super important to me because I'm doing a decent amount of CrossFit these days and my shoulders are kind of creaky. So having a pillow that is stuffed just to the right height keeps my neck and head in exactly the right position and comfortable for the entire night. And as of fall 2023, Lagoon launched their 100% mulberry silk pillowcases. It's cool to the touch, buttery soft, and great for your skin and hair. You've got to go check out this pillowcase if you want to feel great and look great every morning. Waking up for morning workouts has never felt better. I'm refreshed and pain-free thanks to my Lagoon pillow. To check it out for yourself, go to lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance and take the two-minute sleep quiz to find your perfect pillow match and then use the code PERFORMANCE for 15% off your first purchase. That's code PERFORMANCE at lagoonsleep.com forward slash performance, whole 15% off, and the link is in the show notes. You can just click through there. For decades, running shoes have been researched, tested, and designed for men. Brands have relied on the shrink it and pink it approach to sell male shoes to female customers. That's why we are so excited to be working with Hedas. Hedas designs athletic footwear for women that elevates performance, safety, and style. Hedas unlocks the science behind women's biomechanics through dedicated research, creates better shoes for women that support their longevity and performance, and establishes new design standards to promote transparency in a male biased industry. Hedas have a lower ankle collar to reduce rubbing, a breathable mesh toe box to allow for ventilation and to allow for female toe shape, a special kind of plate in the midsole to keep tired legs going, a narrow heel cup to reduce heel slippage and take the pressure off our Achilles, and a rounded instep to create a snug fit. Hedas has three shoe models designed for different sessions, the Alma Cruise for long runs, the Alma Tempo for training days, and the Alma Speed for pushing the pace. I've personally been running in the Alma Cruise and I love them. It's the shoe I always wanted and never knew I needed. The fit is perfect in every way. You can get your own pair of Hedas at Hedas.com and use the code FEISTY20 for 20% off. That's FEISTY20 at Hedas.com and it will all be in the show notes. It's interesting because I I was I also remember reading like don't get your heart rate over one forty or don't cross your anaerobic thresholds if you're pregnant. I remember reading that piece, and I'm like I couldn't, like I couldn't if I tried, <laughs> you know. Now just- I can't. No, yeah, I think like there was a point where I could go hard, but now it's like my heart rate is so low, like. <laughs> I cannot get it going at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that was physical or mental. I'd love, I feel like down the road, we're going to have some, like someone's going to come up with a study that's like, this is this is how this protective mechanism works, you know, like that you actually can't deprive your baby of oxygen for too long. Like this, there was something, because that's actually how I knew I was pregnant. I talked about this last week a little bit, was that like, I was at a training camp in Australia and I couldn't do, like we were doing mile repeats, I couldn't do them. Right. And the week before on the track, I was running 400s and like the speed of my 400s was getting slower by like massive chunks, you know, like by six seconds every time kind of thing. And I remember thinking, that's weird. You know, like what is happening? That is, that is interesting. I think for me, I noticed the breathing for sure around week eight. Like I remember feeling I couldn't breathe as much. And based again, not a researcher, not a scientist. But based on what I've read, it sounds like there's a hormonal shift that happens in the first trimester that like makes it harder to breathe. And then I think maybe it decreased a little bit in the second trimester, but now it's like, now my diaphragm is like 
you know, being pressed up because the baby is like, like basically up against my, my boobs. Right. So like, so now like I can't breathe again. Um, (laughs) So it's, it's kind of interesting. Like I feel like it wasn't linear for me, you know, like I, I, like there was definitely what you're describing, but I think it got a little better and then it got worse again. I think that was true for me as well. I think, I think also like the first trimester was kind of, was a little bit difficult for me because of the nausea and stuff like that. Like there were all kinds of, and then the second trimester, like I, for a lot of women, I think gets a little bit easier to kind of settle in. Then you start to get big enough that you're, that it actually affects your movement. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, that's similar. Yeah. And I think it depends on the sport too. Like I definitely have had like running has been like a different trajectory than swimming. Um, you know, so it depends, like maybe it's lot, you know, being horizontal versus vertical, who knows? Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, I'm just thinking about like the mindset of an endurance athlete, like it's hard for us to, you know, if someone told us just to rest, it would be very difficult. Like, what was it that made you feel like, you know, you wanted to continue with training through that time? Oh yeah. That's a great question. Um, I think there was a few things. I mean, the first was like, I mean, I was, we were, my husband and I were, we were trying to get pregnant, but I, it happened in the middle of a a season. And so I was kind of like, Oh, I've done all of this work to like get ready for triathlon season. And now all of a sudden I'm pregnant. And like, it's not just that I wanted to like go and do the races that I wanted to do. It was also like, it's my social outlet. Like I have a pretty busy life, like outside of training, like I have a job and, um, this is how I see my friends and this is how I stay social. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so there was that, like, I wanted to be out with my friends. Uh, I live in Brooklyn. And so there's a park called prospect park that like everybody goes, runs, rides around. And like, that's where I go see people. And I wanted to be able to continue to be social. Um, so I think that played a really big, part of it. Um, and wanting to like show and like in the first trimester, you, you're not really like, I ended up telling people, but wasn't telling everyone. So you I also didn't want to like show up to races and be like, you know, I'm just like not racing, <laughs> you know? Right. So, so it was without like having to tell people. Um, and I did end up like kind of letting on to some people that I, I was pregnant in that first trimester. But so I think a lot of it was just like, this is, wrapped up in kind of like my identity as a person of like, this is my social outlet. This is the thing that I'm planning to do all summer. And I had like kind of all these plans. Um, and it, I think that's still true, uh, that like I've continued on because it is a social outlet, like even on new year's day when I was, I don't know, I guess I must've been around 30. Like my tri club had a new year's day run and I wanted to go out and like see everybody. So I went with them. It was, it was slow, but like they stayed with me, which is great. Um, so I think a lot of it had to do with the social element and just like, that's how I view myself. And like, even like I'm thinking today, I just, uh, I did like a 1500 yard, it's kind of silly, but cause I'm at 35 weeks, but I did a 1500 yard time trial in the pool, but it was like, not, not an all out effort at all. It was just like, try to make it through the whole 1500 yard. It's, and it was like, if you enjoy the athletic process, which I do immensely, like I was like, what pace am I going to go? Can I negative split it? Can, like all of these things that you just enjoy about the process of training, or at least I enjoy about the process of training. It's still true as a pregnant person. Um, and I like, you know, some people might want to take it easy, but for me, it's like someday I will be slower, right? Like I'll be, I will get older and I will get slower. And I still want to enjoy training. And just because I'm slower doesn't mean I can't enjoy that process. I think, you know what I mean? I totally, totally. And also like, you know, based from my conversation with um, Dr. Christy Adamo from last week, like we know now that actually exercise is good for all pregnant people. You That's know? true as well. This yeah, is the yeah. new kind of, you know, it's like literally flip the switch on, um, on what we used to think. Um, and of course, like for someone who's generally more inactive, that would be different. The way you sc- would scale into a little bit of activity is completely different from an endurance athlete like yourself, who's like scaling down essentially. Um, how much are you doing now at 35 weeks? 
Oh, that's a good question. I would, it's definitely reduced a lot. Um, maybe like five to seven hours a week, I would say. If I had to make a guess, I mean, I could go like look up my training peaks right now, but I probably around five or seven, five to seven hours. It's definitely a lot less than I was doing before. That's really interesting. That's about where I landed um, near the end of my pregnancy as well. And I started with, you know, I came from training camp 30 hours a week to, you know, once I learned I was pregnant, I didn't want to, I didn't even want to do 30 hours anymore yeah. to like 20 hours for a little while. We were in Australia. It was fun. We were doing stuff, you know, to coming back, you know, then like right down to like, you know, I was about the same five to seven hours of just a couple 45 minute sessions a day. Yeah. 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 It's like, um, down to like two runs a week right now that I just went down from three and then I swim three times a week, like around 2000 to 2,500 yards. And I'm biking three times a week and they're all under an hour. They're like anywhere from like 30 to 45 minutes. So it's all pretty short, (laughs) short and easy. So, yeah. Is there anything that has surprised you in a good way or a bad way during the process? Um, yeah, I mean, I think oh, there's been a lot. I mean, I've been surprised by, you know, being able to keep like my, I didn't think I would still be running at this point. I think I was surprised by my ability to keep running. Um, it's very slow running, <laughs> but I'm surprised that I'm still doing it. Um, I am. I am surprised by like the nonlinear nature of it. Like um, that, like there are some days when I just feel like terrible and it's really hard to do things. And then there are like some days where I'm like, oh, I'm killing it. Um, And so I think that's been pretty surprising. Um, I'm surprised by, again, this is maybe a Brooklyn's because you kind of alluded to uh, people having negative reactions to women training. And I feel like in Brooklyn, like when I go out into the park or if I'm swimming, like people do such crazy things in New York city that like everything is normal. So like I get a lot of like positive encouragement outside, um, which is really nice, um, from people. And I was kind of like expecting, um, maybe some negative feedback from people, but I, I just, I haven't experienced that, which is very nice. Um, I think online, I probably, if I were like more of a, a, like a, social media or an influencer or something like that, maybe I would get more negative stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Trying to think of other things like um, also just like how many people have like in this document that I published, but also just like me posting updates on social media, how many women have reached out to me before they've told anyone else they're pregnant and said like, Oh, I'm pregnant too. I'd love to ask you this. Like, I think women are kind of craving stories like this and stories of women who are going through it so that they can share and relate um, to what's happening in their own bodies. And like, I just, I've gotten so many messages from people like I haven't talked to in a long time or barely know of just like sharing stories, which has been pretty interesting as well. I, I agree with that. Like when I was pregnant, I was pregnant, my daughter's 12 now. So I was pregnant 13 years ago. Right. And the only source of information was of the, the blogs of other elite athletes that's kind of where I went for that. There wasn't a lot of these studies that like you would see that we talked to Christy about last week have been since then, you know? Um, so that was really interesting. But also I did find that like, I did myself love hearing the stories of other women who had been through it and stayed active through it. But also that like, there were a lot of people who wanted to tell me their pregnancy story or tell me, you know, in the pool change room that they had been swimming uh when they went into labor you know or they were still doing flip turns until week 37 you know you know what I mean like we all have this these stories that I um for whatever reason like they it's like they're very very people are very very keen even myself now on this podcast I'm like oh good like let's talk about pregnancy stories so I I just feel like the outlets for that are kind of few and far between um and we could probably do a little bit more of that Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like, especially for women who are still in that like first trimester and there's like the social norm of like not telling people it's like, I think people really want to be able to, especially when it's like so brand new, um, people want to be able to share what they're experiencing. 
but like, don't feel like they can because they can't make it public. And I think that's also kind of like an interesting thing, but yes, people love to share stories. And I think it's especially important for those, the women that are like, it's like brand new and like, what is happening? Like, I don't understand, like, what can I do? What can't I do? I'm feeling very confused um, about what's normal, what's not normal. <laughs> I'm like, there is no normal, but, <laughs> but, but uh, cause everybody is so different, but yeah, I think that's definitely a big surprise for me of just like how much people want to share and, and, and tell each other things. Yeah. And I think I would also question that social norm around keeping quiet for the first, you know, essentially the first trimester. Like I understand that it's the kind of thing, like not everybody wants the whole world to know if they have a miscarriage and that miscarriage is more common in the, in those first few weeks. And that's kind of why we do it. But it's interesting because I was told I was told by my doctor, oh, you probably want to keep this to yourself. Just share it with your family. And I actually remember like independently kind of thinking, no, wait a second. The people I need to share it with is anyone that I need to, that I want to know if I also, if I have a miscarriage, like right. I have this group of friends that are like, I actually want them to know that I'm pregnant because it, I, I don't suddenly want to be like, now I'm going through this mourning process of miscarrying a child. And then like, didn't tell them I was pregnant in the first place. Like that just made no sense to me. Um, and I think it would help sort of normalize that a little bit as well. Like that to normalize the fact that like miscarriage is can be part of the process you know it's not that uncommon yeah it's so true and it's interesting that you said and I think the other thing though is like when yes we need to normalize that miscarriages are part of the process I think for athletes specifically like what I've found is if there's like an athlete that whose close close friends are not athletes then that's when I'm like getting these stories from people that are like not necessarily close to me, but they want to share and like, they feel, um, so it's interesting. So like, I don't know if how they would feel if I knew they had a miscarriage, but they, they feel like opening up because I've shared my story. If that makes sense too. Yeah, totally. In your document, you talked a little bit about your mom and I just, I, I wanted to ask about this because it's just kind of a one line that says that she was a single mom, three kids stayed active through her, her, um, all of her pregnancies. That's absolutely incredible. Um, and it's incredible that you like, as a child sounds like to you, you sort of took in that her strength. Um, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, she's, she's really incredible. So she, like, like you described single mom stayed out. I mean, she was running basically and like until a couple of weeks before she gave birth to all of us, um, including, my youngest brother, and she was pregnant at 43 with him. Um, and she was a teacher and I, I actually started my career as a teacher. And like, I remember when I started that career, I was like, Oh my God, teaching is so hard. How did my mom do this as a single mom with three kids <laughs> and maintain like an exercise schedule? So I think, you know, growing up, just watching her, like it became totally normalized that like, oh, you work out every day and like you stay active every day. And like, I was an athlete growing up and it was like very, very normal to just like continue doing all of those things. And like, she's, she's 72 now. And she's still, she's not a triathlete, but she's still some bikes and runs all the time. Wow. Um, like pretty much every day. And, um, and so I think having her as an example, especially as I became pregnant, I was like, oh, I remember because I was, I was nine years old when my littlest brother was born or my youngest brother. Um, and I just remember her doing that. And I was like, well, if she was able to do all of that. Why can't I? And like having that example and like it, just her example generally throughout my life, but like that example um, of somebody kind of maintaining things through pregnancy completely normalized it. And like, I think, you know, as I've talked to some of my friends who have moms, like I have enough, like a couple of friends who are pregnant and like, maybe their moms are saying things like, Oh, you should take it easy. Like, yeah, don't, don't go to, you know, like all of these things like that hasn't really been the case with my mom. Like she's just like, I mean, she does say like, don't overdo it, but like, it's just completely normalized that I would continue to, to exercise. So, yeah. And like, yeah. I She's great. <laughs> yeah, she sounds great. And I I feel like, you know, even for myself 13 years ago, I got some different messaging, I think, than I see my friends who are pregnant 
you know, now, and it's hard for me to imagine like in the eighties and nineties that she wouldn't get some pushback around that. Do you think that she did or have you ever talked to her about that? Yeah, I have. I mean, I asked her, I was like, did you ever ask your doctor like what you should do? And she was like, no, I just did it. Oh, um, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do think she did. I mean, like even, you know, frankly now, like when I speak to some people that are close, like closer in age to her, like they'll make comments about it. Like, oh, I don't know if that was a great idea that she did that, but I'm like, I don't know, I'm fine. Right. Like, like I turned out okay. Um, and my brothers turned out great. And, um, and, and so I'm sure she did, but I think she, I don't know, I guess she just didn't care (laughs) that much. Yeah. And she was like a racquetball player too. I don't actually know if she played racquetball through her presence, but that seems like a little bit dangerous. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, she even told me like her, my, my littlest brother was, was breached, like le- leading up into her, she thought she was going to have to have a C-section and she attributes him turning around to her, like being on the Stairmaster. She like, I felt him flip when I was on the Stairmaster. So like, yeah. So there's like, I think she like even recognized there were like benefits of, of kind of staying active. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have a good friend who, um, she was on the Paralympic team for skiing for 20 years. Oh, she's yeah. wow. older than I am. And she, at some point during her career, heading into an Olympic year, she got pregnant and she was like, Atlanta would be probably in her sixties now. So this is, you know, 40 years ago. And she, instead of, she didn't tell anyone, she just didn't tell anyone she was pregnant because they would have downhill skiing. She did downhill skiing. So they would wow. have, yeah, they would have stopped her. Like she would not have been allowed. And she wanted to go to, she wanted to go to another games. So she just wrapped up her belly, just literally strapped herself in and just trained and went to <laughs> Oh my gosh. How far along was she when she was there? At the actual Olympics? I don't know. But I do know she was like kind of pregnant for a whole, like she knew she was pregnant. She was pregnant for like a whole training cycle, at least into the, enough to have to wrap her belly. So she must've been mid, at least midway (laughs) through her pregnancy. I just thought that was great. Like talk about someone who's like just completely willing to uh, listen to her own body and do her, you know, of course she was, she wanted to take care of her son and she did and everything was fine. Um, but she also wanted to go to another Paralympic games. So, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I think this is like going back to like what I said about that, that fear-based versus fear, like, I think they're like, she was fearless. Right. But she listened to her body too. So there's like that, there's the balance and I don't know. I, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just interesting how different people will make different decisions um, based on like what their own, like, if, if you can, it, I think it, it comes down to like, you probably do need to have like a good sense of your body and a lot of confidence <laughs> to, to really, to pursue it, especially like in that day and age, I think, like, I think about my mom or the person you're describing, like they must've had like a lot of confidence in, in their bodies and what their bodies were capable of and, and being able to listen to them. So, yeah. Totally. Okay. And what are some of the resources that you found the most helpful? Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I think, um, there were, there are some pot, well, I'm actually looking up at, at like this document that I, I wrote right now. Like there's one book that I, I really liked called exercising through your pregnancy. I cannot remember the name of the author off the top of my head, but that was really good. And it was like all at science evidence-based Um, there's another one called exercise and sporting based activity through pregnancy evidence-based guidelines. Um, I can send you the links if you're interested in that. Um, one that I was really into one podcast that was really good was in, um, on, I think I referred to it before the British journal of sports medicine, where they looked at that at, um, like one of the big concerns for pregnant women is like, people say, oh, you're not supposed to get too hot. Like, and they actually did this study where they found like, they're like women are, they self-regulate, like their bodies will kick in and like, they never overheat because their body's mechanisms for protecting the pregnancy, like cools them down. Um, which I thought was really interesting, um, as well. So I can send you 
the links to all of those. Sure. Yeah. We can put those in the show notes for everyone. And Maria, how many weeks are you now? 35 weeks. Well, almost 35 weeks. Yeah. In week 35. Yep. Amazing. Okay. And do you hope to continue to be active right up until the day? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't see any reason not to be. I mean, running is definitely getting a lot harder. Like I'm doing a lot of walk runs, but swimming and biking are fine still. So I don't see any reason to stop. I've started doing yoga too, which is good. Um, But yeah, hope to go. It's interesting with running. Did did you say, did did I read that you wear one of those belly bands? Yeah, that's been really helpful. It's been very helpful to have the belly band, but um, now it's getting to the point where to go to the bathroom all the time. I'm like really lucky that I have a treadmill right next to a bathroom in my apartment. And so like, and then the park I go to, there's like a bathroom every half mile or so. So like I can kind of stop along the way, but, um, that's like been kind of an issue. And it's like some days is some days are worse than others. I'll just say that. I think I stopped running around 34 weeks. And the reason was because like, I could feel her hitting my, like I could feel like her kind of hitting my pelvic, my pelvis. Like I felt this like clunking, you know? And I was like, I don't know. Like I was comfortable, but I didn't like the noise. It's like my baby. (laughs) You can hear a noise. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought, you know, that's fine. I can walk. It's it's good. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, I mean, maybe that will happen eventually with me. It's the things um, <laughs> that you least expect. We, I also had like a very low amount of fluid, you know, so like that was probably part of it, but she was just, you know, <laughs> who knows? It is kind of crazy. Like how it's just so different for everyone and everyone feels like a little bit different and can do things a little bit differently. And I think, again, that's like one of, one of the things that was one of my biggest takeaways is like, it is so individual. And like, yes, there's all this data coming out and there are studies coming out, but at the end of the day, it's like, everybody's still an, it's like training, like, as if you're anybody else that's not pregnant, like everything has to be individualized. Like if you have a busy life, if you, uh, you know, like how you get sick, if you're traveling somewhere, like all of these little things are going to impact, like, there's no, like, this is exactly how you have to train all the time. And it's like, true of pregnancy too. And I don't know why I thought it was going to be any different. (laughs) So, but I I did, I was like, what's the perfect recipe for this? And there's just, there isn't one. Um, You can just take the data that you can find and, and, and do the best that you can with it. I think. Yeah. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think as athletes, we're often good at like both sides of that coin of like the times when you have to, it's like, here's a training program and you just have to execute on it. Right. Even if, if, even if some days it feels bad, you don't think about it. And then there's other times when you have to listen to your body and really know what's best. Um, so I am pregnancy is probably a little more into leaning more into the listening to your body side, but I think mm-hmm. athletes generally tend to have those skills. So I think we can all kind of get out there and be as active as we feel like being. Yes. hundred percent. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for talking us through your experience. And we will link to some of the resources that you talked about in the show notes. And yeah, all the best with uh, the next few weeks. Yeah, thank you so much. As a lifelong runner and triathlete turned CrossFitter, I am stoked to announce that the athletic eyewear brand Tafosi Optics has joined us as a partner here at Feisty Media. Tafosi sports glasses hit all the marks for athletes. They are shatterproof poly bicarbonate, so the lenses not only reduce glare, but also offer scratch resistance, which I 100% need. They stay in place when you are moving. The hydrophilic rubber nose pads actually get more grippy the more you sweat, so they are secure and don't slide down your face even when you're running in hot conditions. No matter what sport you do, Tafosi has shades for you. Whether you love tennis, fishing, pickleball, running, cycling, or just hanging out on the beach. They are super reasonably priced, which I love, so I can have multiple pairs that go with any outfit. And of course, feisty listeners get a special discount. So 
head on over to tofosioptics.com and use the code FM20. FM as in Feisty Media to get 20% off your order. That's FM20 at tofosioptics.com. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. Building muscle can be tough and gains can be so slow, even for those of us who do a lot of strength training. As an ex-endurance athlete who is now in perimenopause, I know this all too well. It can be frustrating to put in the time in the gym and not see the results I'm looking for. That's why it's super important to take the right supplements at the right time. One of those supplements is essential amino acids, which are needed to trigger muscle protein synthesis. Muscle protein synthesis happens when you eat high quality protein, like eggs or whey. And by supplementing with additional essential amino acids, you can make sure you are getting the full benefit of your training sessions. Targeted essential amino acid formulas can be up to four times more effective than just eating protein. I've been taking amino acids for almost a year, and in combination with eating quality protein and a couple other supplements, I have managed to turn the tides on age-related muscle loss, which starts at 30 for women, by the way, and I have continued to make strength gains as I head towards 50. AminoCo has been a longtime sponsor of Feisty Media and has supported all of our brands and podcasts over the years. I recommend starting with AminoCo Perform, and you can grab some at aminoco.com forward slash performance. If you enter the code performance, you will save 30% and receive a free gift if it is your first purchase. Give it a try and let me know how it goes. That's aminoco.com forward slash performance and use the code performance to save 30%. 